Missed last week, no worries. Um, my coworker Robert is on with us and he is a social media technology guru. He recorded it and uh, was able to do some edits and it's on our YouTube page. So if you didn't know we had a YouTube page, send myself or Robert an email and uh, we can go ahead and uh, email over that video to you if you wanna watch it. Um, I know we kind of have a hodgepodge of folks who are on with us this morning. This initiative was actually started by um, the APS squadron. Um, um by uh mr butler and mr jc cruz thank you thank you so uh they're gonna be on with us this morning too they are very very bought into our financial program and the services that, that um, we offer so they're gonna give us a robert's gonna give a little intro just kind of a, a zoom overview and then he's gonna turn the floor over to them just to give us some of their insight and personal story um and then the floor will be mine again and we'll really dive into the meat and potatoes of it good deal so awesome well good morning everyone um it looks like for the most part everyone who's on with us this morning um <clears throat> has joined us the past couple weeks um, my name's Beth. Uh, my coworker Robert is also on with me this morning, and I believe we are now in week five of a, a seven-week financial resiliency or financial readiness um, curriculum that that APS really kind of was was the backbone in, in driving us to develop this. So the first couple weeks, if, if you missed it, we talked about kind of the the fundamentals of finances. So we talked about budgeting, value-based savings goals, controlling your spending. Um, we talked about building goals that relate to uh, what you value and what your family wants to accomplish, whether they're next year, the next 10 years, or the next 30 years. Um, we also talked about paying down your debt, building that emergency savings. Uh, we talked a little bit about credit cards and consumer loans. We've talked about um, the TSP. Uh, we have talked about pretty much everything leading up onto a financial pyramid all the way up to the very top, which is what we're going to talk about today, which was going to be investing. Now, next week, we're going to talk about car buying. And then the, the kind of wrap up is we're going to talk about home buying. So um, in theory, if you're, if you're on with us this morning, you have a, a strong monthly budget that you're utilizing. You have a good control over your spending. Uh, you've built your emergency savings and uh, you have all your high interest level debt paid off. And then kind of at that point, it's okay, hey, let's, let's go ahead and let's start letting my money work for me. I am ready to go ahead and, and start investing. So um, what we're gonna talk about today is gonna be these six things. So the first is what is investing? What is investing? <laughs> Uh, why invest, how to invest, where to invest, and then also things to consider. Um, so kind of as we're going through these six things, I want for you to think about um, what are your financial goals and what's the timeline of when you want to achieve it? Because when I'm talking about investing, uh, some of this might be, hey, I want to buy a car in three years and I'd like to have a $5,000 down payment. You probably want to put some of that money into an investment so it can grow for you. But if you say, hey, it is currently June and I want to buy some Christmas gifts in December, that money should probably go into your savings account just because you don't have enough time for that money to, uh, to grow in the market. And you also don't have enough time to really have a lot of risk with that money. Um, we're also going to talk about to a little bit further, your timeline of your goals to make sure that you're using the right platform for that investment. Because if I'm investing for retirement, that should be in one platform versus if I'm investing for a down payment for my vehicle, that should be that should be in another platform. Um, so as we go out go throughout this brief, this is kind of a, a, a thousand foot view on investing. This really doesn't go uh, really in particular into the nitty gritty of it. And so that would be something that would be great for us to do in a follow up one on one appointment. Uh, the reason being is because when I'm talking about investing. It's really hard for me to make general blanket statements. It's gonna be based off of your goals, your preferences, your risk tolerance, so on and so forth. Um, as always though, if you have any questions or anything that you wanna contribute this morning, um, since I'm sharing my screen, I'm not able to see everybody. So please either just go ahead and interrupt me or if you want to the chat box, um, my co-host Robert, he's gonna be monitoring that and he'll be able to, to monitor that. So 
but just kind of so I have a general idea of kind of where, where our minds are at this morning. When I say investing, um, what topics or what, what catchphrases do you guys think about when, when I use the term investing? Stocks. Mm -hmm. Bonds. Stocks, bonds. Real City. estate. Real estate. Making the money work for you. Yes, making the money work for you. Awesome. So I'm kind of convinced you guys have already sat in on this brief. Yes. Yeah, so stocks, bonds, real estate, making that money work for you. Um, mutual funds is also another one that, that people uh, typically usually uh, say when I ask that question. So essentially, I think Aaron might have been the one who said money working for you. It is money working for you, right? Uh, now, there's always going to be some type of risk involved with investing, though. And it's very, very different than savings, okay? Um, so in theory, the longer I can sit and let my money grow, uh, the more compound interest is going to go ahead and start working for me which in turn is the more money I'm going to have in my account. Um, the longer my investment can grow, the less I actually need to invest to have the total amount at the end of the day because of compound interest. Compound interest is essentially interest on interest. Okay. So, in every essence, it's, it's going to be free money. Um, I'm actually pretty excited that this workshop fell kind of in the year uh, that it did because I know <clears throat> in uh, February, March, stock market went way, way, way down. Everyone was freaking out about the concept of investing. Uh, but as of yesterday, I think that the market has almost recovered. Uh, I, I think uh, the term that I read was that we are now officially in a recession. Um, so the stock market's always going to go up. It's always going to down, go down. And this is a great visual representation because there's always going to be risk involved with investing. But what I want for you to think about is what's my timeline of when I'm going to want to use that money. So I'm almost 29 years old. Um, when I'm talking about investing for retirement, I should have a pretty high risk tolerance because I can't touch that money until I'm 59 and a half, right? But if I want to just start in three years, I should have a smaller risk tolerance with that down payment money than with my investment money for retirement because if the stock market goes down, right, is it going to go up within the next three years before I need to buy that car? That's what I don't know. Is if the stock market goes down today, is it going to go up again before I retire? Well, yes, I, I, I'm willing to take on that risk that sometime within the next 30 years, the market's going to go up. And it's very, very different than saving because the money that I'm putting into an investment, it's no longer liquid. So my emergency money, I want to keep separate. And this could be... Um, whether it's my 500 or my thousand dollar emergency, this could be if it's um, my some of my goal getting savings accounts, um, right? So for me, I have gifts, I have vacation, I have car service, um, I have a running account. Um, you might have a rainy day account, right? What whatever it might be. I don't want that money to be tied up in an investment because if the stock market goes down and I have that emergency. Well, at that point, if I pull that money out of the stock market, it's at that point that I've taken that loss. So let's dive into this a little bit further. So on the screen, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead, Robert. A question though, we're like, what are some common, you know, barriers of people that not investing? What are some of the big things that get in the way of people not do the investing you found? So first and foremost is some people want to invest, but they can't because they're so tied down to their high interest rate debt. Um, so if you've got like a $30,000 credit card bill, right, you've got to get that paid off first before you can invest. And $30,000, you're not going to have that paid off in six months, right? That might take you a couple of years. Uh, the second barrier is just a lack of uh, financial literacy. So either not understanding why investment, that investing is important, um, or it could be something as simple as they have a very low financial literacy literacy so they don't have a monthly budget established. If you don't have a monthly budget established and you don't know um, what cash you need on hand, then how do you know what your surplus is that you can go ahead and part with to go ahead and put into an investment? And then I would say probably the third barrier is just a fear. Uh, and I would say that's typically due to lack of knowledge because it's like, well, how do I invest? Where do I go to invest? What's my timeline on investing? You know, so on and so forth. So investing starts off with investing into the knowledge of getting smart. It sounds, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because knowledge we, we, is power. Yeah, we typically fear what we don't know, and we can shy from that a lot easier. So yeah, everything you've said makes sense. Um, lack of lack of experience, lack of you said financial literacy, which is great. So I, I did want to find that, just call that out, and find out why folks don't do it right now. Um, thanks, thank you for that. 
Um, so on this screen here, kind of from left to right, it's going to be the least amount of risk to the most amount of risk. So uh, when we're talking about investing, uh, the lower your risk tolerance is typically going to be associated with a shorter time period uh, to which you want to utilize that money. So again, it's June. So the money that I want set aside in my gift savings account for Christmas, right? That's in six months. I'm definitely going to keep that in my savings account. But if I want to go on a like month long backpacking trip through Europe in three years, I'm probably going to put that money into some type of an investment. So there are going to be some cash examples of investing. So you can purchase a CD. Has anybody purchased a CD before from, from wherever they bank? <laughs> Or whoever they bank with. Certificate of deposit, no. no. Yes, Beth, I have. Okay. Awesome. Can you can you tell us a little bit, uh, Lieutenant Han, about purchasing that or, or what that process looks like? Yes, yeah, so I just went on USAA. It was maybe like a 10-minute process, and you just kind of decide how much you want to put into it. And um, obviously, the, the length of the time that you're putting it into the CD determines how much per, or what percent you get back. Absolutely. So that's pretty much exactly how the process works. So you can go pretty much to anybody who you bank with. Um, and let's say that you have a thousand dollars that you're willing to, to turn in for, for a CD. You would give the bank a thousand dollars and then they're going to give you a set amount of time um, that they're going to keep it for it to reach its maturity. So let's say that it's a thousand dollars and they're going to keep it for two years um, and that you get a 2% return rate on it, right? You're like, well, that 2% is fairly low. Well, for doing absolutely nothing, right? You just let the bank borrow your money for two years. You made 20 bucks off of it. Now, the longer I let the bank keep it and the more money I give them, the higher that interest rate becomes. Um, but a lot of times too, people will do CD ladders. And so essentially how that works would be, hey, I'm going to give the bank $500 every other month. And then after a year, right, I'm always, every other month, I'll have $500 that's going to be becoming available to me. Um, there's also money market savings accounts. And this is very, oh, I'm sorry, let me loop back. With the CD, there's a 0%, there's 0% risk with the CD, essentially. Um, but if I need that, if it's a two-year CD and I need that money in six months, I do have to pay a penalty to pull it out before it reaches maturity. Yes, sir. The difference between a CD and, say, a bond, federally, who, who, who backs it? Mm -hmm. They're just a different concept. So uh, a bond is um, the interest rate of a bond can fluctuate. Um, bonds carry a little bit more risk, so you're typically going to get a higher return with a bond because day-to-day, -day, the interest rate on that bond can change. Where with the CD, it's a fixed lower, but it's a fixed interest rate for a set amount of time. Um, you can also get a money market savings account. So with a, a typical, I know with my savings account, I have to have at minimum $50 in there um, to not have to pay any fees. $50 is a fairly low rate, uh, a fairly low dollar amount, right, to have to keep in there. Um, but let's say, though, I have, uh, maybe I have $10,000 in my savings account. Um, I would argue with you that depending on your goals, that's probably not incredibly wise, right? Unless you're about to get out of the military and you need a nest egg, or if you're purchasing a home in like two months and you want it for furniture or whatever the case might be. But I wouldn't keep $10,000 in my savings account because it's, it's, um, it's not working for me, right? Interest, uh, I'm sorry, inflation is about 2%, 2 to 4% every year. Um, so if I keep that $10,000 in my bank account for five years, right, it, it's not growing. I would argue that you've actually lost money because the purchasing power has gone down. But what you can do is if you take that $10,000 and you put it into a money market savings account, um, they are going to give you a little bit higher of an interest rate than your typical savings account, but it's going to have a much higher minimum deposit that's, that's going to be required for it. Um, and then again, just that, that standard savings account, and that's where you should have all your short-term goals would be in there. And then in the middle, um, these are going to carry a little bit more risk than those cash examples, um, but these are going to be government bonds. So if you um, are investing in the TSP and your money's in the G fund, uh, the G fund is a kind of a similar topic, a similar concept as a government bond. Um, you can also get corporate bonds. Um, so if you're into the stock market right now, the Barclays Capital is an index that, that kind of follows uh, some of those more of those corporate bonds. Um, and essentially what happens is when you purchase 
purchase a bond, uh, you it's kind of like I don't want to say a share, but but kind of sort of you you purchase a, a, a piece of it, um, and then it has a it has a set interest rate. And so kind of the goal is that as I'm purchasing this bond, the interest rate is going to go up. Stocks and bonds have a negative relationship. So when the stock market was not doing well in March, the interest rates on bonds were going up. Now that the stock market's going up, the interest rates on bonds are going to go down. But bonds carry a lot less risk than stocks, okay? So when I say that the interest rate on the bonds are going up, it might go from like 4% to 5%. Okay, versus when I say the stock market's moving, it might go from like a 12% return to a 22% return, but it can also go from a 22% return to like an 18% loss. Okay, so there's stocks are going to have a lot more risk, so they're going to give you a lot more swing on, on that, that pendulum. And then on the far right, these are going to be our equity examples, and these have a much higher risk but a much higher potential for a return, okay? In order to be putting your, your money or your investment in, in these equity examples, you wanna make sure that it's an appropriate platform to match uh, the timeline of when you're gonna to wanna to use that money. So uh, you can purchase stocks, uh, you can purchase stocks in small companies, medium companies, large companies. Uh, for those of you who have already been sitting in on with us, you know that I'm gonna tell you the best way to mitigate your risk is to put your eggs in every basket. Um, you can also purchase US-based stocks you can purchase foreign stocks and then you can also purchase um, <coughs> things such as oil gold grains um, if you're purchasing silver or gold you can actually purchase chunks of it uh, that you can keep in your home in like a safe or you can purchase a piece of paper that says that you own a, a per particular amount of it and then you can also have um, uh, real estate and those types of things uh, I always tell folks um, a lot of times people are like hey I want to purchase a home like right now because it's an asset yes a house is always an asset but it's also a liability okay um, not even a week after I bought my home I had a faulty cold water valve in my half bath uh, sink down here um, I had I was home when the water leak uh, occurred. It ran for about 15 minutes uh, and I came downstairs and I was like ankle deep in water. It was almost $30,000 worth of damage. Okay. So is that an asset or a liability? That's a liability, right? At, at that point. So I need to make sure that if I am going to be purchasing real estate, that I've got adequate insurance, I have adequate uh, emergency savings, right? Because typically the uh, deductible on your car insurance is going to be about $500. Uh, the deductible on your homeowner's insurance, the lowest that I've seen is $1,000, right? So uh, I also had to have more emergency money uh, set aside to have a plumber come out on a Saturday morning, right? So on and so forth. So Again, I'll, uh, what I'm, the point I'm trying to drive home with these higher risk things is that yes, these investments are definitely um, an asset, but at the same time, I want for you to remember that these are liabilities. So make sure that you, you have adequately covered all your bases before you jump into any of these investments, okay? Um, the other thing to think about is if you're like, hey, I, I really wanna dump a ton of money uh, into purchasing oil, and then the price of oil goes down, and now you wanna go on vacation. Well, you might not be able to go on vacation because your money is tied up in what used to be an asset, right? But now it's lost money, so you've gotta ride it out. Any questions on this? Because this is probably the most important portion. No, no, no question, a little antidote though. I was talking to my financial advisor, um, I think about five or six years ago, and I was at the point, I said, hey, what about buying gold, you know, on the markets? I was watching the TV and I thought, why is there all this big fuss about gold and, and precious metals? What's the big deal about it? And he said, well, when I start seeing commercials and pop-up stands on, on, um, on CBS as uh, we buy your gold, it's probably not the best time to be buying precious metals, is what he <laughs> said. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is just best opinion. This is not any financial advice or anything, but uh, we, we purchase silver and gold. Um, personally, though, I purchase the actual chunks of silver and gold because, you know, heaven forbid something goes really well. Well, if something goes crazy in the world, right, what type of barter system do you still have? Well, if I have an actual chunk of gold, right, that gives me a little bit of a leg up versus if I have a certificate saying I own a chunk of gold. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any means, but it does help though, right? If, if I want to have diversity. So 
Uh, I have my, my savings account, right? I might have some CDs that are stacked up for some money I want in the next two years, but I want to go ahead and start getting some return on it. Um, I probably also want to have some type of investment in the middle. It's, it's going to be in some of those bonds. And then on the far right-hand side, I probably am going to have something purchased in some type of stocks. I want to diversify it U.S. and international. And then if I want to add even more diversity, right, that's when I can go in and start purchasing these things such as silver or gold or, or property. Real diversity. <laughs> yes, lot diversity is going to be your friend, okay? Yeah. So speaking of diversity, so what's in your portfolio matters. So I've used this example before, right? Let's say 10 years ago, I went out and I purchased stock, but I only purchased stock in Target, Walmart, Sears, uh, Belk, and Kmart, right? Well, what do you think happened a couple of years ago when Amazon and all this online shopping came out? What do you think, what, if those were the only five things I had in my portfolio, what do you think has happened to my portfolio since? then anyone it hasn't has gone bankrupt or it's close <laughs> <laughs> yeah right well two of those companies aren't even yeah. in business anymore yeah. so that really did not give me a lot of diversity so this um this Tight chart here is a really good example of how to diversify. So when I'm talking about financial planning, I'm not just talking about one of your goals of going on vacation or one of your goals of, of going on retirement. Financial planning and once we add investing into it is a entire, a holistic approach to looking at your finances. So when I'm looking at this pie chart for diversification, this is a lot of diversity and the more diversity you have it's building in these safety nets to go ahead and and give you some cushion um just in case something happens with the market or if you have an emergency or whatever the case might be so <clears throat> you can see here right if i had some stuff in government bonds this is going to be pretty low risk short-term corporate bonds right that's also going to be pretty low risk low risk down here right so there's a lot of money in large company stocks. So this might be, hey, I want to um, purchase a home in 10 years and this money that I have in stocks is what I'm gonna pull for my down payment, um, so on and so forth. So this gives me, this is a pretty great holistic picture of me probably working towards four or five financial goals. Um, and also keep in mind that when you're investing, um, when you build your budget, obviously build in your short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals, right? Because it's a lot more motivating to control your spending when it you're, you're not going to Target or you're not, you know, ordering out because uh, you're trying to save money for something that you actually value and something that you want. But you might be in a situation where your family has a $400 surplus every month and you don't need that money for anything. It's, it, literally just sits there that might be money that you can go ahead and throw into the stock market and you could probably have a pretty high risk tolerance with it right because you don't need that money anytime soon so if you walk away with nothing today but one thing this is probably it diversity matters and make sure that you are uh, giving yourself some diversity in your portfolio that way it's going to be building in those safety nets for you so when does investing make sense? This is probably gonna be a review for most people um, because this is kind of something that we have been hitting the, the past five weeks, but you have to have that adequate emergency savings um, bill, okay? So for me, I don't have any dependents. Uh, Robert uh, has a spouse and several children. His home is larger than mine, right? There's a lot more on Robert's shoulders financially than what's on my college shoulders. College planning. Yeah, college planning. <laughs> um, Rob, so all my family, for the most part, lives in Knoxville, Tennessee. I can literally, if an emergency happened, I can get in the car and drive there. Um, Robert has some family mm -hmm. who's in England, right? So he would need a lot more in his emergency savings to potentially get to family than I would. So, uh, the amount that should be in your emergency savings is going to be a very personal number. It's based on your liability. So just talking about myself and Robert, Robert needs a larger emergency savings than I do. Talking about Beth and Beth, Beth today needs a larger emergency savings than Beth did five years ago because I now own a home. Okay. Once I have children, I'll need even a larger emergency savings, so on and so forth. Adequate insurance. If you learn nothing from my house flooding story, you need adequate insurance, okay? I have brand new floors, I have new drywall, I have new paint, I have uh, a new sink, I have new plumbing, right? I had adequate insurance that covered all of that. 
I would have so much gray hair and I would be so stressed if I did not have adequate insurance. And because I basically drained most of my uh, financial liquidity uh, with the down payment on the home and some furniture and appliances to get moved in, right? So if I did not have adequate insurance, I would have had to have put a lot of this stuff on a credit card, you know, uh, at like I, you guys were sitting on with me earlier this this month, I think that the interest rate on my credit card from the, the consumer brief, I think it was like 29% or something like that, right? I, I would be paying that off for a long time. Also really important, make sure that you don't have any high interest level debt. Again, if you're like, well, Beth, I have student loans at 4% or I have a car loan at you know 5%. Let's talk about that offline one-on-one, -on -one, but as a general blanket statement, I think that's okay. Let's go ahead and start investing. But if you've got a credit card and an 18% interest rate, you've got to get that paid off first. And then make sure you understand the risk potential reward trade-off, okay? So yeah, if I put this money in the stock market, I might lose it, okay? And then also make sure that you have a long enough time frame uh, for that money to actually sit there and grow. Any questions in the chat box, Robert? Are we all good? No, no questions. But I want to summarize what it takes to get to this because we're at week five and I was listening to you talk about everything you said that we've already talked about and discussed. So our knowledge level has gotten a greater you know, density. Mm -hmm. So the steps people have to take in order to get to this level, this is a the turning point from, you know, reacting to your money to managing your money, right? Is where we're at right now. Spot. And this is the turning point where once you start talking about investing, this is where you can really start creating generational wealth. Right. This and, that, and so what it takes to get to this point is what a kind of I'm on the fly, Beth, but can you summarize briefly what it really takes to get to this point, starting off with like knowing your budget expenditures? Mm -hmm. So first off, you have to know your income. I know that sounds basic, but a lot of people have no idea. Right, right. Uh, we talked about it. You have to know your monthly bills together. That creates your budget. You have to have controlled spending. You have to have value-based savings goals, right? So I have to have the forethought to say, hey, I love Tennessee football. I want to go to four games this year, and I want to be able to go to Florida uh, next summer. So this is what I anticipate the cost is going to be. And it's detailed, right? I'm going to have yeah. to pay to board my dog. I'm going to have to pay for an Uber uh, to the airport. I'm going to buy airport food. I need lodging. But you're investing into the process. The more you analyze, the more you put right. into it, the more you plan, the more you invest. And the more time you spend planning and investing, you know, to do this, the more buy-in you have in making that happen. Oh, I'm, I think I know where you're leading. You have to be invested in your finances in order to start investing. Is that what you're looking right. for? Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's getting too technical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's step four. So we're invested in your finances and now we're at the point of making wealth. Yes. So let's talk about why invest. Um, so I know for me personally, I'm investing because I would like to retire one day. Um, I was investing for a down payment on a home. Um, for those of you who are on the call with us this morning, why are you guys, what are some of your goals or your motivations to invest? Yeah, I'd love to hear some of this, to be honest. Generational wealth. Generational wealth. I agree with that, Sergeant Butler. Who else? Being able to retire comfortably, knowing that I've put money aside in case something big happens or for children in the future, they want to go to college and that kind of stuff that they're all taken care of. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't want to put too much of Victor's personal business out there, but I am like so proud and so pumped for Victor because his family is growing. He's at a stable point in his career. And even with these added, you know, the additional cost of, of having a baby and things like that, he's still saying, hey, this is a really important time that I need to really tighten up my budget. And yes, I know I'm going to have diapers and formula and all these other expenses, but I'm still going to um, prioritize investing and things like that. I, I love that. Anybody else have any, anything else that they're, they're working on investing for? Hi, this is Chris. Hi, Chris. Um, hi, because of COVID and I got in a car accident right before COVID, COVID I've been able to pay off a lot of my debt. Mm -hmm. So now I have money to invest. So I'm trying to figure out what to invest in that I can make. So I'm just going to be honest. I don't, I didn't put anything in my retirement. Well, I, I did, but I had to liquidate because mm -hmm. I went through a divorce and all that fun stuff. Right. So now I'm trying to figure out what can I do to get a faster return on my investment so right. that I can retire sooner than later. 
Right. Absolutely. So, so Chris, it sounds like you're in a situation where you're trying to balance uh, taking on an appropriate risk tolerance uh, to to achieve the goals that you're looking for. Right. Awesome. Awesome. So I heard a lot of really great answers. So I heard uh, retirement. I heard generational wealth. I heard college. I heard family planning. Um, Anybody else? I I don't want to exclude anybody. No? No, Awesome. So those are all those are all the major the major reasons to invest. So uh, why do I want to invest? It might outpace inflation. That's my goal, right? Uh, because uh, if I'm just hiding money in the backyard for 15 years, well, inflation is two to four percent every year, right? So in theory, I'm losing money. Uh, it hopefully is going to earn more and accumulate more. So if I want to have half a million dollars when I retire, well, if I save it, I've got to save every penny versus if I'm investing it and I'm getting like a seven to 8% interest rate on average for 30 years, I don't have to save every single penny of that. Okay. Uh, Saving alone might not be enough. Uh, And then again, the bigger return I have, the less that I have to set aside. And I think that's kind of where Chris is right now where life happened. She had to liquidate her her retirement uh, investment. And so she's trying to uh, put money appropriately aside into a investment platform uh, that's going to give her a larger return, right? Because she doesn't have quite as much time, or you might be in a situation where you're not able to put quite as much money aside that you would like into an investment. Um, So if you've been with us since week one, uh, I try to slip this slide into almost every single brief that I give. It's one of my favorite slides that we have. Why should you invest? So this is a screenshot I took from TSP.gov. If I put $10,000 into my TSP for in, in 2020, if this money grows for 40 years, which is realistic for some of you, right? Because I can't touch this money till I'm 59 and a half. If it gets a 7% return rate, In 40 years, it's going to be just shy of $150,000. Heck yeah, that's exciting. I don't know anybody who would not want to be in this type of situation, right? I only had a $10,000 out-of-pocket expense to have $150,000. But two key things here. Number one, I had to be willing to part with that $10,000 today. That can be a struggle for people, right? Especially when like, well, I want to go on this trip or I want to eat this sushi or I want to buy these new shoes, right? I'm right there with you. Um, And then uh, also the luxury in this situation is that they had 40 years for that money to sit and grow. One thing I do want to show you on this slide is please don't be discouraged because a lot of people are like, oh, Beth, my money's been in this investment for 18 months and it hasn't done anything. Dude, it takes time, right? It takes time to grow. So this is retirement. So this is a very different investing concept than what would I than what I would do if I'm trying to like play penny stocks or or get rich quick in the stock market, okay? But if you look at this, do you see how slowly this money is growing? Okay? I mean, golly, the first it's what? At year 12, my 10,000 is now 25,000. Beth, 12 years and it doubled. Well, heck, it's still free money, right? Because of compound interest. But what I really want to show you is that the earlier you start towards your goals, the better. Because if I want to purchase a home in 10 years and I start now, that money is going to have 10 years to grow versus if I start investing in five years, I'm not going to have as much time to get returns. So I'm either going to have to put it into something that has a higher risk than what I'm comfortable with, or I'm going to have to set aside more each month to get to where I want to be. You really start making the big bucks on compound interest the longer it sits and grows, as you can see here. Um, So I'm almost 29. So let's just round up and say that I'm 30. Let's say that I did not start investing for retirement until I'm 30. And let's say somebody on the call this morning is 20. The money that you put in your TSP today carries more weight than the money I put in my TSP. Because if you look at it, right, if you got a 10-year head start over me, where's this money sitting at at about 30 years? $75,000 because I started 10 years later than you, right? So my 10,000 would be 75,000. Your 10,000 would be basically 150,000, okay? (laughs) Time matters. So start early, teach your kids about the concept of investing, teach your kids about budgeting. Uh, If you're 25 and you're mentoring an 18 or 19 year old in your your work center, talk to them about it, right? Uh, If your parents are not investing and you're like, well, Beth, that's weird. No, it's not weird. Talk to them about it, right? Um, This stuff really knowledge is power. And I think knowledge is the key thing that's stopping people from investing. I'm going to skip this slide because I kind of already reiterated the point in the previous one. Yes, sir, Robert. 
I wanted to on your little story you're talking about compound investing. Um, I remember one of my instructors told me this a while a long time ago, and I'll, I'll be quick. But it's like if if I was good at playing golf and you weren't so good at playing golf, and we made a little side bet of a penny a hole, right? Whoever wins that hole gets a penny, but we'll double it every time, right? So if I get the first hole, I win a penny, right? The second hole, I would win how much? Two. Two pennies. And the third hole, if I win? Four. Okay, would you take that bet with me if I was a good golfer? No, I'd be broke. Because? <laughs> well, because by the time we get to hole, what, what there's 18 holes in golf? Yeah. I don't know exactly how to do that. How much did that penny grow to, do you think? Answers on a postcard. <laughs> a lot of money. I'll look it up while you're doing this. I'll come up. Yeah, yeah, look that because I did be in like the chat. Yeah, it'd be a lot because every time it doubles in the little bit, it doesn't matter. But I know after, it's in the thousands. It's in the thousands. I know that. Once you're on hold, though, like ten. Yeah. Or, like you're on your second second game. Yeah, I think yeah. When you're in, like when it gets like hole eleven, you're at like you're in the hundreds already. So just the, the magic of compound interest in only in eighteen holes. Mm -hmm. Hold on, back to where you were. That's a great example. I'm probably going to steal that from you. Is that copyrighted? No, no. I'm at five dollars and twelve cents at whole eight. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we're talking about investing, these averages that I'm showing you, these are just averages. Averages do not guarantee anything. So, um, when we're looking back over at it, right? If we're looking at stocks, typically about a ten percent return. Bonds about a six percent return. Cash is about three percent. Um, so this would be when they use the term cash, they don't actually mean cold, hard cash. That's like the CDs, the money market savings accounts, and then inflation about 2.7. But again, uh, uh, and this data is a little bit old, so it doesn't include kind of the downfall we just went through. But uh, in 2002, stocks lost almost 20%. 2008, stocks lost almost 40%. Um, I will say this, though, be encouraged because anytime the market goes down, it always goes back up. 2008. I think the I fund in the TSP, it's an international fund, had like a 30 or 40% loss. 2009, it had like a 20 or 30% gain, right? So um, the market does typically recover relatively quick, um, but is it gonna recover before you need that money? That's what you need to think about. I show you this slide though to, to show you that if you just keep all your money in savings, based off of inflation, you're gonna be losing money. So do you need to put some of your, your stuff that you have a low risk tolerance with into a CD? Or do you have a little bit more of a risk tolerance where you can put it into a bond? Or is it money that you don't need for a long time so you can go ahead and put it into stocks, which is gonna give you the, the most return? So let's say that I have 250 bucks a month and for 40 years, I put that into one of these three investment platforms. Well, assuming stocks, bonds, and then the cash, which is like a CD or money market savings account, assuming I get the returns that we just talked about here, look at those differences in returns. So you might say, well, Beth, stocks are getting a 10% return, bonds are getting a 6% return. Why does that matter? Well, over 40 years, putting the same amount of money into each platform, I have 1.6 million in stocks. I have a little over half a million in bonds. And then in those very, very low risk ones, right, I have 237,000. So at least though with this one, it kept up with inflation, but I wanna make sure that you're using the right platform with your risk tolerance with the appropriate timeline. Because if you don't need this money for another 20 or 30 years, I would hate if you put it into a bond when you could have put it into stocks, which more appropriately matches your risk tolerance and you would have gotten three times the, the return on that, okay? So how to invest. This is the meat and potatoes. This is all why you guys are probably here this morning. So um, investing is relatively easy to do, but the part that's challenging is to do it well. What do I buy? What's a fair price for it? What are my fees? When do I buy? When do I sell? How do I diversify? Right, kind of what Robert was talking about. Well, hey, if I'm seeing all these advertisements about people wanting to buy my gold, it's probably because the price of gold is pretty low in the market right now, okay? So probably not a good time to buy. In theory, I want to buy when the price per share is low. I want to sell when the price per share is high. And that's essentially how you make your money. Well, you make it one of two ways. When you sell it for a higher price than what you bought it for, or a lot of companies are going to pay dividends. So if I have five shares in Target and I bought each share for $5, right? That cost me $25. If the price goes up to $6 per share, I can sell it. And right. And now I just made a dollar off of each share. 
What else Target might do is say, hey, we're gonna give every single shareholder 25 cents. So I would get $1.25. I could then take that money and spend it. What a smart person would do though is take that money and I'm gonna buy more shares with it. And then that's how my portfolio is, is going to quickly grow, okay? Um, so I do wanna to talk to you guys real briefly about mutual funds. Um, I really like mutual funds because it doesn't require a lot of sweat equity. So I can individually go out there and purchase stocks and purchase bonds, but it requires a lot of sweat equity on my end. So if you want to do it that way, don't forget you still wanna diversify your portfolio. So a great starting point might be, think about your daily life. So no federal endorsement intended, but I know for me, um, uh, I like coffee, so maybe I'm gonna look into Starbucks. Um, I like Burger King, I like shopping at Target. My cell phone is Verizon. Um, Dominion Energy is my electric company. Um, I like Coca-Cola. Uh, my car insurance is through USAA, right? I'm kind of going, trying to give myself some diversity in regards to like, I'm not just going with those five shopping stores, right? But then I have to actually go and do research to see, well, what is the price of these stocks? Or what are these the price of these bonds? And I'm going to exit out of this really quick. Let's see here. And this is actually relatively easy to do. I'm going to show you how to do it. So let me go to Google really quick. So again, I'm not recommending any of these companies. You guys can see my Google screen, right? I didn't. Yeah. Awesome. So let's say that I want to look to see um, Amazon stock price, right? Sweet. Dang, if I had Amazon this morning versus now, it's gone up a little bit, right? A 0.78% return, that's pretty fantastic. So you can literally just go here and, and start doing some research, okay, on these different companies. But I just listed off like five to 10 companies. I have to do the research on all those companies and then decide whether or not it fits in with my risk tolerance. So how do I do that? Well, if I wanna have it for about a year, maybe I wanna look at the one year return. Maybe I wanna look at the five year return. Um, this is actually pretty impressive that it's been all in the green, okay? So there's a lot of things that, that I can do to, to kind of look at to see where it's at. Heck, what if I are you looking at, Beth? I'm, 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 I, I see your PowerPoint show. Um, you can't see my Google Doc? No. I mean, you can't see my internet? I can see just your PowerPoint presentation, but it's in the small windows format. Okay, let's see here. Let me, oh, that's why you can't see what I'm doing. Now, can you see it? Now we can. Now you can. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let me just move this because I can't see all of it. Sorry. Okay, so if, let me just loop back real quick, right? So I can see the one day, the five day, the one month, right? Year to date is gonna be January to today. That one year, because it's, it's June, will be June of 2019 to June of 2020, okay? And then the five year, so on and so forth. But I'm gonna have to do this for every single company that, that I've been thinking about. Um, and then I might find that some of those companies actually aren't, aren't good for me. So there's just a lot of sweat equity in this, right? Because I'm gonna have to do a ton of research. Now, some people really like it. Me personally, um, I don't like doing all of that research. Um, so if that's the case and you're kind of like me, let me switch back over. Uh, you might be interested in purchasing mutual funds. And what mutual funds are is financial advisors have taken all these different stocks and all these different bonds and all these different companies, and they have built these mutual funds. So um, I don't have to do as much sweat equity. I don't have to do as much research. Um, so what I'm able to do is I can invest a little bit more quickly without it being such a large time commitment. Uh, so it, it's pretty easy uh, to find these mutual funds. Um, if you look at this window on the far right hand side of the screen, if I'm playing baseball and with Robert and I throw the ball and it goes through this bottom half of the window, I'm going to have to replace this whole window pane, right? The top half of this window is, is mutual funds and it represents diversification. So if I throw the ball and it goes through right here, right? Well, because these frames are built in, I'm only gonna have to replace this small portion of it. I still have majority of this top half of the window. Mutual funds work the exact same way. So let me go back here. Now, I wanna clarify, I am not recommending any of these companies just for the sake of time though. I'm just going to go ahead and pull up um, USAA's mutual funds. 
Again, I'm not recommending them. I'm not saying use them or don't use them, but just so you can kind of see how to go ahead and start doing your research. Um, now you can do this with anybody who you bank with. Well, if you have like a real small hometown bank, they might not have investment options. Um, I do want to say one thing. So I was talking to, to a friend who invests with USAA over the weekend and she was really upset because she got a notification that USAA was transferring their investments to Charles Schwab. That's not abnormal, right? You still, you still can manage it through USAA and through the app. Um, it's basically they're using Charles Schwab as a contractor. Almost every single place does that. Uh, so if you get a notification that it's making some changes, don't panic. Just make sure that your fees aren't changing. The TSP does the exact same thing. TSP doesn't manage their funds. They, they, they bid out a contract to another company to do it. Um, but I just want to show you, though, from, from a research perspective, uh, when you're looking at these, some mutual funds are going to have smaller initial investments, such as 50. Some are going to have, hey, you have to have a $500 initial investment. Some you might have to make a monthly contribution to, so on and so forth. Um, so when you're doing those, and you're doing your research for your mutual funds, let's say that you say, Beth, I have a pretty high risk tolerance. Sorry, this link always gets goofy. <laughs> so you might say, Beth, I have a pretty high risk tolerance. Um, once this link loads, uh, if it loads, we can actually go ahead and search for the mutual funds based on your risk tolerance. And it's mutual funds are really great too because it's so easy to see uh, the performance, the fees, so on and so forth. So let's just say here that i know that i am interested in an aggressive or a very aggressive fund uh, because this is money that i don't want or i don't need anytime soon what's really cool here is this tells me a little bit about the funds just to make it easy let's look at the first two so uh, this one, it's $42 per share. This one, it's $10.48 per share. Um, the year to date, January to now, right? Uh, so this one has about a 9% gain. This one has about 11% loss. The one year time period, five and 10 year, okay? Um, now here I wanna look at the fees, okay? So if I am only deciding between these two accounts, which there's way more options than just that, but I would probably go with the first mutual fund. The reason being is it has a much higher return rate history, right? The 10 year, 13.63 compared to 8.9, but the expense ratio, right? This first one has a much higher average return rate, which with a much lower operating cost, okay? However, this first one might require, so um, in the initial minimum investment is 3,000, and then I have to put in $50 each month, okay? Where this one, okay, it's the exact same. A lot of times though, they'll, they'll have different investment um, minimum deposits and things like that. But with these mutual funds, right, it's very easy for me just to kind of look at a couple of them and then go ahead and make my decision off of that. Um, does everybody feel comfortable? Again, I'm not recommending this company. I just kind of wanted to show you how easy it is to do your research online. Does anybody have any questions about doing research for mutual funds? No, nobody's asking anything. I know it's kind of difficult. Where do you start? And that's the hard part. So I would probably start with whoever you bank with um, would, be, would be my recommendation. Again, no federal endorsement intended. Some of the big companies I see people kind of use time and time again. USAA, Navy Federal, Vanguard, those are probably the three larger ones that I see. I'm not yeah. making any recommendations. I'm not telling you where to go. I think though typically the easiest starting point is whoever you bank with because if you're setting up a $50 contribution every single month, it's pretty easy to take out of your bank account when you bank with who you're investing with. Um, you can also talk to your friends to say, hey, have you had a good experience with so-and-so? Um, bankrate.com is also another cool resource that you can go to. So if you want to purchase a CD, it kind of will tell you the average uh, interest rates on those. But in regards to mutual funds, uh, a lot of these mutual funds are, are the same, uh, regardless of who, who you purchase them through, they're just going to have a different operating cost. Yes. Yeah. I know some funds are kind of like owned by organizations themselves, like Edward Jones and Raymond James, they have their own mm -hmm. set of funds that they, that they don't sell off on the on, on mm -hmm. open market. The uh, some advice that I got when I was doing my my initial work on this was, uh, if you're curious about what what kind of stock to invest in, you know, um, and it, it, that's an advice thing that we we can't give you all, but 
the advice that we did, like we got was like, well, things that you use, things that you currently know things about, things that you you know, partake in, is always a really good thing to start off investing because you have a some buy into that product, right? Mm -hmm. That, that's spot on. And that's why if you do want to individually purchase stock, that's why I threw out, hey, these are the products that I use. Not for you to go do them, but take that same exercise I did and mm -hmm. apply it to your. So, for example, I really love running. So maybe I want to look into Brooks or Hoka's, right? If I want to purchase individual stock, um, maybe you really love like paintballing or maybe you really love gaming. So you might want to look into like PlayStation or Xbox, right? Cause uh, you, you know, the product and you know that like, Hey, this brand is way better than this brand or, Hey, this is a new brand that I think is just like really about to take off. So now might be a good time to go ahead and purchase right. because it's, it's a brand new price is going to be low and hopefully it's going to you know really kick off and the price is going to go up which is the second tip was to read to get invested to get a little smarter challenge yourself i mean back in my day we talked about doing magazine subscriptions but now it could be a podcast it can be an rss web feed it could be mm -hmm. something that you just check into on a regular basis to keep abreast of being financially savvy mm -hmm. um one thing any, to, oh, any good recommendations for like you know podcasts that you know of or out there or? Besides the MFR podcast? So I would say with podcasts, uh, be careful who you listen to. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a financial educator. So I, whether or not you listen to me, you come to my workshops, you schedule an appointment or you don't schedule an appointment, I make the same amount of money regardless. Um, so I... Uh, I'm kind of like a, a neutral policy or a neutral person, right? I'm just here to provide education. Um, a lot of times when people, if I have a podcast where I am like very, very personally invested in this company, like this specific company, what I say could drive whether or not I want people to purchase stock or not purchase stock. Also yeah. keep in mind that a lot of times people very confidently go out there and say, never do this or always do that. Well, they're passionate about that and they're trying to give good advice. But the thing is that that's the best decision for their life, but that's not the best decision for your life. Right? So I could go out there and say, you should not have your retirement fund in bonds at all. That's way too low risk. Right? Well, Robert and I are very different ages and he's much closer to retirement than I am. So, I can passionately say that's the right decision for me, but if Robert takes that passion and applies that to his life, right, that could put him in a, in a tough situation. So I would just say, just be careful who you listen to. Um, knowledge is power. Uh, you might hear something and be like, wow, I don't totally agree with that, but that gives me a great idea that maybe I want to do, you know, they said do X, Y, and Z, but maybe I want to do like Z, A, B or something like that. Thank you, Beth. You're welcome. One more thing I want to show you guys about with mutual funds. Um, when we're talking about the TSP, there's the five indexes and then there's the life cycle funds. Um, anywhere that you invest with, you can also get an IRA. Personally, I would max out my TSP before doing an IRA just because the operating costs are typically lower. But if you look here too, uh, these target retirement funds of 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050, 2060, that looks pretty familiar. If you're familiar with the TSP, it's going to be a very, very similar concept. Also, fun fact, coming out in July, the TSP just created uh, life cycle funds coming out in five year increments. So there'll be uh, 20. So there's already 2050, but there'll be 20. Uh, they're coming out with a 20, I think 35, 45, 55, 65. So that'll give you some some more wiggle room. Okay. Okay, let me go back then to here and we will kind of wrap the rest of this up within the, the next couple of minutes. Um, ETFs are very, very similar to mutual funds in regards to how they operate. However, if uh, whatever company you're investing with offers ETFs, I would do an ETF over a mutual fund if you like the investment options um, because they have uh, lower expenses because they're a little bit more passively managed, but it's a very similar concept uh, where it's got a, a bunch of companies. And just so you know, with mutual funds and ETFs, some of these mutual funds might, if you have a low risk tolerance, might mainly be made up of bonds. If you have a high risk tolerance, it might mainly be made up of stocks, but you can purchase mutual funds that are a blend of stocks and bonds, okay? Um, this is just kind of, again, showing you diversification, right? If I'm individually purchasing stock, I might not be diversified. The mutual fund is automatically going to give me some of that diversification. Uh, I'm going to go through this really, really quick, but there's a general purpose investing. So this might be um, 
uh, like those mutual funds we were looking at with USA. Um, this might be if I want it to purchase a car in five to 10 years, um, if I want some type of a nest egg, anything like that. Uh, you can also have investing for college. These are going to be 529 accounts. These are fantastic. So if you've got a newborn or a little one on the way, right, you can set up this 529 account, put that money in for, you know, put $50 a month in for 18 years. It's going to grow and give you a much larger return, way better option than taking out student loans and paying it off for 10 to 20 years. And then there's also retirement. We should all be investing in either our TSP or 401k or an IRA for retirement. Um, let's see here. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to blow through the TSP slides fairly quick because I've talked about this almost every single week. Um, but the TSP is the government version of retirement. Uh, civilians and active duty have access to this. Um, you can go traditional or Roth. We have those five indexes and then also those life cycle funds, okay? As a civilian, I'm under the FERS retirement system. I should be contributing at least 5% because I get that 5% government match. If you're in the blended retirement system, I want for you to contribute at least 5% to get that 5% government match. Those statements come though, making the assumption that you've paid off all your high interest level debt already, okay? So G and F, these are my bonds. C, S, and I, these are going to be my stocks, okay? Uh, diversification is all here. Um, these are basically our government bonds. This is going to track the Barclays Capital. C, uh, this goes into stocks. This is our, our large U.S.-based companies. S is our small U.S.-based companies. And then the I fund is our international fund, okay? Right, so when I want to put my eggs in every basket to diversify my portfolio, I'm able to do that within the TSP uh, for, for my retirement. Here are our life cycle funds, right? So I should have a pretty high risk tolerance with my TSP because I can't use this for another 30 or so years. So it, most of my money should be in stocks, as you can see here with the life cycle 2050, but there's still just a little bit in the bonds to give me that diversification. And then as I get closer to this being my main source of income, I want most of it to be in bonds, but just still a little bit in stocks to give me that return. Uh, if you are just joining us this morning, reach out to me for a one-on-one -on -one appointment. Let's further talk about the TSP or watch one of our previous videos that we've done, but I've talked about this almost every week. So I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be the point. <laughs> yes. So uh, we also want to make sure too, that you know, your plan. So make sure that you've solidified your goals, right? I don't want for you to put your emergency money into an investment, know what's needed. So if I want to go on vacation, make sure I've been very specific that I know, hey, this is how much this trip is going to cost. Weigh the alternatives and then pick a path and then go ahead and, and really go for it, okay? Uh, the last slide that we're going to talk about, um, start early when we're talking about investing, right? So if I know I want to purchase that house in 10 years, I should start investing for my down payment now. If I wait five years, I'm going to have to invest more out of pocket to have the same down payment. Automate it. We don't miss money that we don't see in our bank account. And that's why the TSP <laughs> is such a successful platform because uh, it comes out of our paycheck directly. So if you have it set up, so, hey, I want to put $100 a month into my kids' 529 investment platform for college, uh, go to my pay, set it up as an allotment. So on the first, $50 goes out. And then on the 15th, $50 goes out, right? That's the best way to do it. Watch your expenses. The reason why or I said earlier I personally would max out my TSP before contributing to an IRA is because the TSP has much lower operating expenses than what you'll typically see with um, target life cycle funds or anything like that in an IRA. Hang in there. Remember that chart I showed you, the orange one, where I said I slipped this into every single brief? You're not going to see a huge return the first couple of months or the first couple of years, right? So really just hang in there. Let time go to let your investment grow. Do not set it and forget it, okay? So uh, a great example would, let's talk about purchasing a home in 10 years and you want a down payment. I probably would put most of that money in stocks right now because it's in 10 years. But every single year as I get closer to my timeline of purchasing that home, I want to slowly start shifting it to be more so in bonds so that the year that I want to purchase the house, most of that money is in bonds, okay? Um, because if I have it all in stocks and I never change it and then I wanted to purchase my house in March of this year, well, guess what? I probably couldn't purchase it. Um, because one point that I want to make real quick, I, I know I'm basically out of time, but, but something that I do, <laughs> want to say is so let's say that I purchased remember those five stocks in Target let's say that I purchased them for five dollars each 
So my account is worth $25. When the stock market goes down, I don't lose my shares. What happens is instead of $5 each for 25, is that the price has gone down, so maybe now they're a dollar each. So my account now looks like it's worth $5. If I sell them to liquidate it or I move them into an indis a different investment platform, it's at that point that I've lost my money. But people panic and they're like, oh my gosh, my account is only worth $5, I lost 20. No, you still have five shares and this is actually a great time to buy them because they're technically on sale now. So uh, make sure that, that you can kind of ride it out, okay? But that's why though I don't want for you just to set it and forget it. I already talked about be careful of who you follow. And then again, don't, don't swing, don't swing for the fence. So um, Chris talked to us earlier about how she wants to really get the most bang for her buck with rebuilding her retirement, right? She probably shouldn't put all of her money into really risky uh, businesses to try to make up for it, right? Because if it doesn't work out, she's even in a worse spot than she is now. However, um, you know, maybe if, if she would typically have it like 30% um, thirty percent bonds and seventy percent stocks. Maybe she's going to have twenty percent bonds and eighty percent stock, right? Because she's taking on a little bit more risk, but but she's not totally swinging for the fence by putting it into a bunch of really really risky things. Um, so here are some great resources when we're talking about investing. Um, I think uh, being comfortable with the terms um, and really understanding your options and where to go is really what prevents people from investing. Uh, Military One Source has a bunch of awesome information on there. TSP gov has a bunch of great educational information i cannot recommend companies um, however there are a couple of uh, vetted financial places that we can recommend usa educational foundation is a great resource a lot of the graphics um, i have borrowed from them um, another really great one that's not on here that i should add is consumer financial protection bureau cfp B, yeah, CFPB. Um, they have a ton of really great online info. Um, and then again, as always, you can reach out to me. You can reach out to Robert. We cannot tell you where to put your money, but if you're like, hey, Beth, I'm kind of confused about what my fees actually are. It can be it can be confusing to figure it out. Um, I will put my email um, in, the, um, in the chat box. So if you would like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment uh, for us to go ahead and talk about that, um, we, can, we can also definitely do that together. I'm sorry, y'all. I went three minutes over. Does anybody have any questions for me? They are just firing mad, man. They're all pissed off. You went so fast. I know everyone's so quiet this morning. <laughs> I kind of appreciate it, though. I had, a, I did have a lot that I tried to squeeze into an hour. And I was squeezing that out of you. No, no. The answer, though, I did put the answer up, and you're welcome. He's the guy who asked the question. Two thousand six hundred and twenty-one dollars and forty-four cents. After eighteen holes. After eighteen holes. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. A after. The first five holes, it was 32 cents. The second 10, after, after 10 holes, it was $10.24. 15 holes, $327. And those last three holes is where it really boomed. It's like your graph that you were doing like that. Yeah. It got, <laughs> I got, I got half that amount. <laughs> Maybe I something. Which, yeah. So it takes money to make money is a phrase, right? Mm -hmm. It does. All right, Roberto, anything else that you wanted to share with the group? Thank you all very much for coming back and taking this knowledge on board. Next week is a- Car buying. Yes, we might have a special guest for car buying, huh? Yes, and, and I will say you might be like, Beth, I'm really comfortable with car buying. Uh, if you are sitting in, in the, the seat that you wanna be a financial mentor to somebody, this is where I see most people get into a, a lot of problems. Um, and there's obviously people who make good financial decisions, but stereotypes are often there for a reason, right? So if you have not driven through the dorm parking lots, I would encourage you to do so. Most of those folks drive nicer cars than me. We make very different money. Uh, so <laughs> anywho, I will leave that as a little teaser, a little cliffhanger. So I hope that you're able to, to join us next week. Well, I tell you, every time you go out and buy a car, it's, it's never been a pleasurable experience for me. But um, I always go prepared and having a lot of knowledge doing the research. And I've learned a lot every time I've taught a class and talked to people about buying a car. So even if you have got a lot of experience buying a car, I guarantee you will learn something, a trip, a ticket, an idea of how to better prepare yourself for the next time you go out and spend a lot of money. And I won't even pretend to be the expert. Um, I purchased two vehicles. Robert, our guest speaker, do you remember how many he said he had purchased? Yeah, he's got quite a few under his belt. 
I think it was like I have, I have close to 18 myself you know, in, my, in my life. Um, and that's not talking my kids' cars or my, anybody else, but I'm not, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a chore and it takes preparation and planning. It does. Research. So we will dive into that next week and I am, I'm excited. I hope we'll see, see a couple of y'all back. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. If you have no questions, um, Victor, I will get that stuff out on the YouTube today. All right. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Okay, gang. Thanks very much. It's a, uh, it's a cut. Awesome. Okay. And um, this is open to everybody. So, I mean, it's a zoom link. So we do provide services to joint base Charleston, but you know, if you're like, Hey, I think my little brother would benefit from this or, Hey, I think, you know, whoever would benefit from this, we're already doing it. So send them the Zoom link. We're, we're more than happy. The more the merrier. Um, it is specifically mainly targeted for APS. I know CPTS and the med group are also jumping in. But really, the more the merrier. And, and I hope that we see you next week on Tuesday, 9 o'clock. Yeah. Right, yeah. Great job as always, Beth. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this morning, Amy. <laughs>